Good morning students, I am Dr. Roy and as we all know that we have started discussing rhinitis and its various types. So today our topic of discussion would be acute rhinitis. Acute rhinitis can be of three types that is the viral rhinitis, the bacterial rhinitis and then there is an irritative type of rhinitis. But before we proceed with the lecture, I would like to recall and reiterate the definition of rhinitis. I know and I presume that you all know what is rhinitis, but again, just to recall and make you remember the terms and definitions, I am reiterating this. Rhinitis, in, in not in medical gibberish, just to make you understand, in, as simple as possible, rhinitis is inflammation of the inner lining of the nose, that is the mucous membrane. The difference between acute and chronic, I presume that you all know what is the difference between acute and a chronic condition. So the viral rhinitis specifically because we are discussing acute rhinitis today. So acute rhinitis specifically is any inflammation or infection that lasts for few days up to four weeks. And in contrast the chronic rhinitis would be any inflammation or infection of the inner lining of the nose or the mucous membrane of the nose and paranasal sinuses lasting for more than consecutive four weeks. So this is the basic difference that of the between the acute and chronic conditions. Please bear it in mind. The duration is very important because it defines the acuteness or the chronicity of the condition. The first type of acute rhinitis is the viral rhinitis and again the viral rhinitis is divided into three types that is the common cold the other term or the medical term for this common cold is coryza the second is the influenzal rhinitis which is due to influenza and lastly there is a uh, viral infection that is due to exanthemas we'll be discussing it in detail later on but right now we adhere to common cold so common cold is a viral infection and it can be due to different or several viruses amongst which there is adenoviruses or picoRNA virus. There are different subtypes of picoRNA viruses as for example rhinovirus, coxsackie virus and then lastly there is enteric cytopathic human orphan virus. Any of these can lead to common cold or coryza. The incubation period usually lasts from 1 to 4 days and the illness can last up to three weeks. Please bear it in mind. Patient who usually show up in OPD and they want some medical treatment from you, please make it clear to them if they are suffering from common cold or coryza, that the illness can last up to three weeks. There is no magical med medicine that we have on us that can instantly make them feel healthy. It can, it can last up to three weeks. Please bear it in mind. This is very important for you. Right, we discuss the clinical feature how the patient presents in the OPD. Initially, he or she has a burning sensation at the back of his or her nose that is later on followed by a sense of nasal blockage, discharge and sneezing. Nasal discharge is also known as rhinorrhea. So initially, the nasal discharge is watery and profuse but later on it may become mucoperonate. It's not incumbent upon every patient to have such kind of discharge, but in some patients, yes, it can become mucopurulent, which is due to a secondary bacterial invasion. The secondary invaders, I hope you all know, are Streptococcus, Hemolyticus, Pneumococcus, Staphylococcus, etc. Another important thing that I would like to mention here is the intensity of the fever, because at the end of this lecture, you will be given a sort of a quiz or um, you can say um, an assignment which you people have to submit within 48 hours. So the important constituent of that is the intensity of fever. In viral rhinitis, the fever is low grade. It is not high grade. Please commit it to your memory. The patient feels chilly. This is also important. Okay, regarding the treatment, bed rest is very important in order to curtail or cut down the course of the disease. The patient is encouraged to have a lot of warm fluids. 
he is supposed he or she is supposed to maintain a good level of hydration apart from this just to make the comorbidity or the quality of life easier you you can prescribe anti allergics and decongestants and if the patient is having headache fever and myalgias you can also add analgesics another important thing that i would like to mention here is that one is supposed to give non aspirin containing analgesics the reason being if you give aspirin it leads to increase shedding of virus so there is no point in viral rhinitis of administering an, an antibacterial which is a common practice amongst our country or amongst our colleagues so this should be condemned if you are suspecting viral rhinitis there is no point of giving giving an antibiotic or specifically an antibacterial but there comes a role of antibacterial whenever you suspect that there is a secondary infection and secondary invaders were as you all know you can recall streptococcus pneumococcus staphylococcus haemophilus klebsiella morbidella etc so there is a long list i hope you all remember this so this is important that there is no role of antibacterial in the treatment of viral rhinitis until and unless there is secondary infection by bacterial organisms usually the disease is self limiting and it resolves i have already mentioned it that it takes up to 3 weeks it usually resolves within 2 to 3 weeks but occasionally it can get complicated and if you recall the anatomy or the surrounding regions i, I have already told you many a times that there is no point in cramming different complications or different sequelae of the diseases the easiest thing that you can do is recall the anatomy so if you are discussing nose you can recall the what are the surrounding structures you have paranasal sinuses you have throat region and then you have ear i presume that you all can recall the complications that can occur but still i will revise it for you okay let us presume that patient is now having rhinitis and there is a certain complication that can occur so in the vicinity of nose we have paranasal sinuses the so sinuses can also get involved and lead to sinusitis apart from this you all know there is a nasopharyngeal end of eustachian tube and the other end open into the middle ear so infection can ascend from the nasopharyngeal end into the middle ear and that can lead to otitis media you all know this but just to reiterate the fact and then there are the complications presuming that the patient is having acute rhinosinusitis if the patient is having post nasal drip and that is infected it can lead to tonsillopharyngitis the other complications such as bronchitis and pneumonia or the low respiratory tract infections are also explainable in the similar way the next type of viral rhinitis is the influenzal rhinitis it is due to viruses influenza virus that is type a b or c and again the signs and symptoms are very similar to those of coryza or common cold but important thing to mention here is that there are more chances of complications in influenza rhinitis due to bacterial invasion as compared to common cold and lastly we have the third type that is rhinitis associated with exanthemas okay there is a term this medical gibberish exanthemas what what is meant by this term exanthemas in simplest possible term it is a rash so viral exanthem would be any rash or eruption of skin that is a symptom of a viral infection different viruses that can lead to exanthemas or exanthematous fevers are measles rubella chicken pox which is also known as varicella roseola and then there is a fifth disease it is not mentioned in your book but i have presumed that you people are studying microbiology you are well acquainted with this thing as well the rhinitis that is associated with exanthemas are preceded by these infections and the chances of complications are more frequent and severe the secondary infections are more severe and then they can lead to more complications more chances of complications that we have already discussed so please bear it in mind the treatment would remain the same as we have already discussed so this is i guess presume enough for viral rhinitis and now we'll be discussing the bacterial rhinitis okay then there are two types of bacterial rhinitis we have non specific type and then a specific type in non specific infection 
again it can be a primary or a secondary primary bacterial rhinitis is commonly seen in children please bear it in mind and is usually a result of infection with either pneumococcus streptococcus or staphylococcus and on examination of the nose you appreciate a grayish white tenacious membrane in the nose and if you try to remove this membrane epistaxis ensues bleeding from the nose ensues this is the primary bacterial infection so regarding the second type that is the secondary bacterial rhinitis it is due to invasion or infection with a bacterial bacteria which occurs in a patient who is having viral rhinitis so it is a superimposed or supervening bacterial infection patient is already having an acute viral rhinitis and then there is a secondary invasion or supervening infection by a bacteria that leads to a secondary bacterial rhinitis lastly we have this specific bacterial rhinitis that is the diphtheric rhinitis it is now a very rare condition to encounter diphtheria or diphtheric patient nowadays but still as it is mentioned in our books we will be discussing it in detail as well again this diphtheric rhinitis can be primary or it can be secondary the secondary diphtheric rhinitis is due to fascial diphtheria and on examination it, there is a this, please bear it in mind this is very important in diphtheria you you appreciate a grayish membrane that covers the inferior turbinate and the floor of the nose it is it is very tenacious if you try to remove it it the bleeding ensues and there is associated excoriation of the anterior nares or upper lip it it may or may not be present but please bear it in mind it can be present and the treatment of diphtheric rhinitis is first and foremost thing is you isolate the patient you curtail or cut down the exposure of the patient to other people and then you administer systemic penicillin and you give diphtheric antitoxin and lastly there is a third type which is not mentioned here but i would discuss it that is the irritative rhinitis as you all can i, I guess uh, recall we have already discussed allergic rhinitis so irritative rhinitis is more or less same in its nature it is due to exposure to dust smoke or irritating gases which are usually present on uh you should say vocational or the your job you're, you're exposed to this irritating gases these irritating gases such as ammonia or acid fumes it can also be hydrogenic which means it can be induced by a doctor for example a patient presents with a foreign body nose nasal foreign body and if you try to remove it you all you supposed to do some intranasal manipulation it leads to irritation and patient immediately has a catarrhal reaction that is followed by sneezing nasal discharge and then a sense of nasal blockage its symptoms rapidly pass off as you remove the offending antigen or it can persist for some days if the nasal epithelium is destroyed the recovery is instant or if the nasal epithelium is damaged or destroyed it will depend upon the amount of damage and the infection that supervenes so we are done with the acute rhinitis and uh, at the end of this lecture i'll post or float an assignment which you people are supposed to submit within 48 hours and then on the basis of that assignment your attendance will be marked if you have any queries please feel free to contact on whatsapp group thank you very much